Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So Rafi, we continue on with Surah Ali Imran, verses 51 onwards. And in the previous lecture, I told you that there was a delegation that had come from... The Christians? They had come from where? Na. Na, na, yes. Najran, Najran. which is a place in... Wow, already doing so good. Uh, so... Jerusalem. Yemen. Yemen. Wow. So they came from Yemen as a delegation. They came to meet the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because the Prophet had sent them three options in a letter. Embrace Islam, number two. Uh, uh, or be prepared that we will take over. Oh, before, oh, before that. Uh, oh, the first one was to, to embrace Islam. Uh, the second one was that we will take over and then you can practice your religion. Jizya. To pray jizya. Jizya, just jizya. And third is that we will wear for war if you decline. Right. So these people came over to ask them and we said that the beautiful thing is that the Prophet started off as guided by Allah, he started off by focusing on the area of commonality, mm -hmm. which was Yahya alayhi salam, Zakariya alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam's mother, and so on, right? And then he moves towards uh, Isa alayhi salam. And now he's talking about Isa alayhi salam, all of the signs that he could perform, all of these amazing miracles. Again, this is softening the heart because the Christians also believe this, right? So in verses 51 onwards now, this is Isa alayhi salam. He's continuing on. He's saying, indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So worship him. That is the straight path. The bone of contention hasn't yet come. But yes, this is a, a brilliant, um, you know, one thing that now... The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is telling the Christians that Isa a.s. was a great man, he was a prophet, he was the promised Messiah. But what did he say? Allah is my God, he is your God, worship him. He did not say worship me. And then it says, but when Isa a.s. felt disbelief from them, from Bani Israel, he said, uh, who will be my supporters in the cause of Allah? And then the disciples said, we are... We will be your supporters for Allah. We have believed in Allah and we testify that we are Muslims. Uh -huh, this is interesting. So Isa alayhi salam's disciples, do you know how many, how many he had? Twelve. Twelve disciples said, we believe in Allah. We are going to be supporters of Allah. And we testify that we are Muslims. Okay, so again, the disciples are talking about God. Allah the Almighty, not that we are going to be doing this for you, Isa. We will be helping you in the cause of Allah, for Allah. And then it says, uh, Our Lord, we have believed in what you revealed and have followed the messenger, Jesus. So register us as among the witnesses to the truth. This is now, of course, what was being said by the disciples. And the disbelievers planned, but Allah planned and Allah is the best of planners. In other words, as I told you, that uh, the, the rabbis, they were not happy uh, accepting Isa as a promised Messiah, even though they saw all of his miracles, because they knew that he would take away our power. And so they made a plan with the Romans, right? And they made a plan to uh, capture him and to kill him. And I explained over here that the Roman governor, did I tell you about Pontius Pilate? No, I did not. Okay. So this is what Allah is talking about here, that the disbelievers planned, but Allah had a plan too, and it was Allah's plan that prevailed. And let me just finish this verse, and then I'll tell you what I was going to say. Uh, and then it says, mention when Allah said, Oh Jesus, indeed I will take you and raise you to myself, purify you from those who disbelieve, and make those who follow you superior to those who disbelieve till the day of, of uh, judgment, then to me is your return. I will judge between you concerning that in which you used to differ. So again, very important line being given. He wasn't crucified. He was raised um, to Allah. Now, the important thing that happened is that I told you that Bani Israel was under the Romans. Okay. Now, the entire kingdom, which was the north kingdom of Israel, the south kingdom of Judah, remember, that entire thing had been taken over by the Romans. And in the south, which was the kingdom of Judah, there was a Roman governor whose name was Pontius Pilate. Okay. And he was a governor who was governing uh, on behalf of the emperor whose name was Tiberius. So Emperor Tiberius at that time 
who um, he had taken over many, many different lands, including the land of the Jews. And he was living somewhere else. But because, you know, the kingdom of the Rome of the Romans was so huge, they put governors in different places and the governors had to control the land on behalf of the emperor. So Pontius Pilate was an idol worshiper. He was in, in the south and he was um, governing the place on behalf of the emperor. And so uh, the, the rabbis went up to Pontius Pilate and told him that there's a man who is amongst us. He's a Jew and he's calling himself the king. Okay, now the uh, English translation of the word Messiah is king, right? Because th that's what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to uh, reinstate the kingdom of Israel and become the king of the kingdom of Israel, right? So he could spread Islam. So, um, so they told him that, okay, there's a man who's calling himself a king. Now for Pontius Pilate, who's a governor, who was governing on behalf of the king, Emperor Tiberius, if there's a man who's calling himself the king, and not the emperor, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So Pontius Pilate found out, okay, there's this Jew and he's calling himself this. And some people are calling him, uh, uh, some disciples are calling him a prophet. So what he did was he took Isa al -Salam, and he sent him to the north. And in the north in specific, um, there was a place which was called Galilee. Now, Galilee was an area in the north, it was used to be the kingdom of Israel. And he sent him there because the governor of Galilee was a man called um, Herod Antipas. Now, Antipas, it was actually a Jew himself, but he had joined forces with the Romans, right? So uh, the Romans gave him a lot of power and lots of wealth, and he was governing over the Jews, but he was basically on the side of the Romans. So Pontius Pilate said, listen, you're a Jew, this man is a Jew, you decide what has to be done. But here's a problem, he's calling himself a king. Now Antipas, he investigated everything, he sent Jesus back. He sent him back to Pontius Pilate and he said, I'm not passing any judgment, you decide. Okay, because of course, being uh, seeing the signs, he knew that this is the promised Messiah. He was a Jew himself. He knew what had been prophesied in the book. So he said, I'm not messing with this guy. So he sent him down and he said, okay, you decide. That is when I told you that the Romans said uh, that there was a fallen disciple whose name was Judasus Iscariot. And he went to Pontius Pilate and said, let me show you where this man Jesus is. So you can, you know, you can basically uh, uh, capture him and you can kill him. Because according to the, the Christians, his intention was that when they harm Jesus, uh, uh, God will get angry, God will send a wrath on the, on the Romans, the Romans will be destroyed, and the kingdom of Israel will become strong again. And unfortunately, instead what happened was uh, Allah then raised Isa alayhi salam, Judas' Iscariot's face was changed to that of Jesus, so the Romans ended up uh, capturing him and then ended up crucifying him. But here's the beautiful thing in this whole story. Herod Antipas, who was a Jew, who was the governor of Galilee, and he refused to pass any judgment to harm or to do anything to Isa alayhi salam. Just a couple of years ago, he had killed someone. He had beheaded someone. Yahya. Yahya alayhi salam. Yahya alayhi salam, who was going around and giving the message of Islam and telling everyone that he promised Messiah is coming. And as soon as Isa alayhi salam was born, of course, Yahya alayhi salam understood that this is the promised Messiah. So when Isa alayhi salam became older, then Yahya alayhi salam started to tell everyone that this is the promised Messiah. We have to now start following him. Right? By the way, Yahya is a Nabi or a, 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 a Rasul? Oh, he's a Nabi because... He he's a Nabi. And what is Isa alayhi salam? The Rasul. But he's a Nabi, but he's also a Rasul, right? So... Um, uh, when Yahya al-Islam started to go around and spread this message, and he also went to Galilee, Antipas, okay, eventually beheaded him. But surprisingly, did he do anything to Isa al No. No. Do you remember what I told you, the difference between a Nabi and Rasul? Uh, the Rasul, yeah, well, well, I know the basic difference, you have never told me. But in terms of this, do you remember? Uh, that, uh, that a Rasul is always uh, protected by Allah. Nabi can be killed, Rasul can cannot be killed. be killed. So can you see how Allah is saying that they plan, but I plan too, and it's always my plan that's going to prevail because Allah is the best of planners. So even though a simple thing he could have done was kill Isa. 
but Allah protected Isa alayhi salam because all Rasuls have to be protected. Rasul cannot die. So he simply sent him back. When a couple of years ago you just beheaded Yahya alayhi salam. Right? So you could have done the same thing here. You could have at least tried. Right? But he said, no, I'm not touching this man. Go back. So he goes back over there and then eventually he gets lifted and he goes up to God. Okay? And so then Allah says over here, again, now the Christians are listening to all of this and they are agreeing because they know. They know this whole story. And as I told you, as far as raising of Isa alayhi salam is concerned, it is mentioned in which place? Uh, the... The 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 in the book of the disciples, the uh, Gospel of Barnabas. The gospel of Barnabas. Okay, because the other disciples' um, gospels have not been found, so the Gospel of Barnabas they were able to find, and it specifically mentions. In fact, the the account of Jesus in that is so similar to the Muslim Jesus, and I say Muslim Jesus because the Christians call Isa alayhi salam the Muslim Jesus, so it's actually very similar. Uh, so, All right, so, so but, that book will also been distorted. No, that has not been sorted. That has been kept preserved. That's how we know that he was in fact uh, raised. Why don't uh, Christians believe him? Good question. Maybe if you find one, you can ask him. <laughs> so verses 52 onwards, it says, And as for those who disbelieved, I will... Sorry, uh, one other thing. Allah mentions in verse 55 that I raised Isa alayhi salam. And then he said, To this day, those who believe in you, I will make them superior than uh, to those who disbelieve. So in other words, what you do see later on happening is that the Christians ended up, um, uh, you know, forming the, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire that used to worship idols like Tiberius was worshipping idols. Suddenly they had a new emperor eventually in the, in the coming centuries whose name was uh, Constantine. Constantinople. Constantine. Oh, sorry, yeah. oh, Constantine. Constantine. Constantine embraced uh, Christianity. And when he embraced Christianity, the entire Roman Empire embraced Christianity. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, the Jews who had denied Isa they were they they were attacked by someone uh, called Titus. Okay, and I will get to that as well to explain what happened. Uh, was Titus the person who built the fire pit? No, 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 no. That that that's someone else. Okay, so this just goes to show that Allah is saying that now towards the end, you will see that the Christians, those who believed in Isa alayhi salam, will be given a higher status and those who denied him will be given a lower status. But nowadays, what you see happening as the Day of Judgment comes very close, Christians and Jews are becoming friends. And they're becoming friends against the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this is now the situation because the time of the Day of Judgment is coming very close, the time of the Jal is coming very close. So, in verses 52 onwards it says, And as for those who disbelieved, I will punish them with a severe punishment in this world and the hereafter, and they will have no helpers. But as for those who believed and do righteous deeds, he will give them in full their rewards, and Allah does not like the wrongdoers. This is now, the, uh, the, the speech that he's giving is coming towards an end. He's mentioned all the important things. He's now coming towards the end, and the Christians are listening. And then it says, this is what we recite to you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, of our verses and the precise and wise message. Indeed, the example of Isa to Allah is that of Adam. He created him from soil. Then he said to him, kun, fayakun, and he was. The truth is from your Lord, so do not be amongst the doubters. In other words, the biggest thing now the Christians are being told is, Isa alayhi salam to Allah, he is just like Adam. Adam was made from the word kun, right? Isa alayhi salam was made from the word kun. So how have you made one the son of God and in fact God and the other one you just say he's, he's just a prophet? And so then Allah says, then whoever argues with you about it after this knowledge has come to you, say come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves and then supplicate earnestly and let's invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars. Indeed, this is a true narration and there is no God except Allah and indeed Allah is the exalted in my, might and the wise. But if they turn away, indeed Allah is knowing of the corruptors. So the entire sermon has ended. The bone of contention has been mentioned. There's a lot of logic in all, in all of oh, this. No, a challenge has been given and at the end, uh, that if you do not believe, then call uh, then call all of your uh, Christians and, and uh, do a prayer that uh, whoever is liar, uh, 
whoever is lying should be cursed by Allah. So now he ends with a challenge. And the challenge is that if you still believe, truly in your heart, you still believe that you are right and this man Muhammad, peace be upon him, is wrong, then let's sincerely sit here and invoke the curse of Allah on, on uh, whichever party is wrong. Let's say, Allah, please, women, children, men, please send your curse on, on the group that is actually wrong. I mean, if you really do have doubt in your heart and you still believe this man is lying, then let's do this. And Allah saying, and if they turn away, which of course they did, then Allah saying, Allah is know, knowing of the corruptors, which means that your heart has testified, but you are terrified of taking this challenge because you know that the curse will come on you. You're the one who's lying. It's not like you genuinely just don't get it, right? Your heart now truly understands you just don't want to. Then Allah says in verse 64, say, O people of the book, come to a word that is equal between us and you, that we will not worship except Allah and not associate anything with him and not take one another as lords instead of Allah. But if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we are Muslims. So just like Allah, when it comes to the Christians, Allah told the prophets, start with the area of commonality. Over here again, Allah is addressing all the Christians and the Jews and saying, okay, let's focus on the basics. The basics is that Jews, Christians, Muslims, we all will only worship one God and we will not attach or associate anything with that God and we will not take one another as lords. So the Christians who assume that their priests and their bishops are also, you know, they have very high status like, uh, like a God, that is wrong. The Jews who believe that the rabbis have a very high status, that is wrong. Now, interestingly, it's not that the Christians worship the priest or the bishop or the pope, okay? They say we worship God and we worship Jesus. The, the Jews don't say we worship the rabbis. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean to say that you have taken these people to be your lords instead of Allah? Meaning whenever you're in a time of a difficulty, the first person you go to to help to, to ask for help uh, are these people and you feel like that they are the only ones who can help you. Right, absolutely. And also whatever they say to you, you blindly follow it. Mm -hmm. You don't question it. So if the priest or the bishop or the pope is saying that Jesus is the son of God, and in fact God, you don't question it and say, okay, so um, this was introduced in the fourth century, right? So for 400 years, how come nobody said this? And suddenly, Trinity was introduced for, uh, you know, 325 years later, mm. right? So you don't question. And when you blindly follow someone or something, then that means that you've made that thing into your God. Uh, one other question can be that how come Hazrat Maryam al-Islam was just changed for uh, Jibreel al-Islam in the Trinity? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so how was it that first it was the holy, uh, the ho the mother who was supposed to be the mother of God, and now suddenly you took her out and you put the Holy Ghost instead, right? Mm -hmm. So there are many questions you could ask, but the, the but if you don't question, you blindly follow, then you've made those people your God, and also we know in, in Christianity, you know, when they, when they go to the church, they say, okay, Father, I have sinned, and then the father says, the priest says, okay, well. You don't worry this and don't worry that. And, you know, they say things to make you feel better. And then they come back feeling good that I have confessed to the priest. When you don't even need a priest, you have a direct link with God. So why do you have to go and confess your sins to another man? And uh, one other thing I want to mention is that, you know, when it comes to this verse where Allah says, let's focus on the commonalities that we all agree that no one else should be worshipped except God. It seems surprising that why would the Christians agree to this? Because the Christians say, yes, we only worship God, but we also worship Jesus, the mm -hmm. Son of God, right? When um, uh, the, the Catholic Church and the Pope, when these things were established in the Roman Empire, uh, you had different groups, different sect that started off within Christianity. And one sect was called the Nestorian Christians. Nestorian Christians were very much prevalent in the Arab region. In fact, Varka bin Nofal, the cousin of Hazrat Khadija, was a Nestorian Christian. Which means they believe in one God. Which means they believe in one God. They never believed that Isa is a son of God or he's divine. They believed he was a promised Messiah and that's it. So they're basically Muslims. Exactly, yes. So they were Muslims of that time. And when Muhammad, peace be upon him, arrived, then those Nestorian Christians who, who believed in him, like, uh, like Hazrat Khadija's cousin, Varka bin Nofal, they then have become Muslim. 
So they were the Muslims of that time, and after following the Prophet, they became the current Muslims. So why, uh, so why is it called an historian Christian? It was just a name, you know, like we have different names that we give uh, the sect in Islam. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what they were called. So uh, when Allah is talking over here, He's talking about those Christians who have agreed that yes, Isa Salam cannot be the Son of God. He cannot even be divine. It doesn't make sense. So Allah is saying, all of you agree to one thing. We all are following the, the Abrahamic faith. So let's all focus on the area of commonality. Stop fighting amongst each other. Is this man a prophet? Is he not? Focus on the commonalities. It's the same message coming. So now use your mind and think, how can this be coming from a different God? It must be coming from the same God. Then verses 65 onwards, it says, O people of the book, why do you argue about Ibrahim while the Torah and the Injil were not revealed until after him? Why won't you use reason? Here you are, those who have argued about that of which you have some knowledge, but why do you argue about that of which you have no knowledge? And Allah knows while well, you don't know. Ibrahim was not a Jew and nor was he a Christian. He was one inclined towards the truth, a Muslim, and he was not of the polytheists. So as I told you before, no, this is the second time this verse is mentioned. Exactly. Second time that Allah is reiterating he was not a polytheist, he was never a polytheist, number one. So in other words, Bani Ismail who are going around worshipping idols, just think about it. The man you claim to believe in, Ibrahim, right, since you are Bani Ismail, you're, even he did not worship idols, so why are you worshipping idols? And then the Jews, I told you, they came up with this theory that no, Ibrahim was actually a Jew because... Uh, God uh, had taught him the Torah and he was actually practicing the Torah. He was practicing all of the laws and the um, the basic rituals, even though Musa had not come. And Allah is saying, how can you say this when you have no knowledge? None of you were there. So where have you come up with this amazing story? Okay. And then the Christian said, oh, well, um, uh, Ibrahim salam, actually he was a Christian because uh, Isa salam, had not yet come. But he believed that Isa would come and Isa would be the son of God. And again, Allah is saying, where is this mentioned? Like, where are you coming up with these stories? So Allah keeps saying, why do you argue about things you have no knowledge? Instead, why don't you focus about things that you do have knowledge about? Like the fact that there is a man right in front of you. His name is Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's giving you a message that is very identical to the message in your book. Why do you ignore that but focus on something that you can never prove? And then Allah tells us that Ibrahim alayhi salam, by the way, he had his own book. And we will see that towards the end of the Quran. He did not have a Torah. He was not given the Injil. He had his own book. We don't know what the name of the book was. But Allah tells us that he had his own book. So that's why Allah is clarifying over here he was a Muslim. He submitted himself to God. He was not a polytheist. And that is it. And furthermore, what Allah is explaining here is that why don't you focus on the knowledge that you currently have? For instance, in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, remember I told you that the Torah also comprises of the five books of, of Musa? Mm -hmm. One of the books is called the Deuteronomy. In the Deuteronomy, it mentions that God is saying, I will raise them up uh, a prophet from amongst their brothers, like unto you, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now Allah's prophesizing a prophet is going to come. And this is at the time of Musa. So between Musa and Muhammad, peace be upon him, many, many, many prophets have come, right? But he's saying that I will raise a prophet from amongst their brothers. Bani Ismail. There you go. So Bani Israel's brothers are Bani Ismail, right? Oh, and, oh, and another major difference, he said that he will put his my words, words in his mouth. His mouth. Uh, the other prophets... They would basically convey the message of in their, own, their word. own words. Brilliant, yes. Yeah. So their books were basically their hadith. Mm -hmm. It was their, uh, they were explaining God's message in their words. But the only prophet who was explaining whatever he said was not his words, they were the actual words of God. That is why the Quran is not the hadith of the prophet, it is the actual words of God. And that's why it is called Furqan. Torah is not called Furqan. Injil is not called Furqan. Allah only calls this book Furqan because the, the words themselves are the words of God. Right? Mm. And so Allah says, I prophesied it. Why don't we have a discussion on this? 
You know, you're going on and on about Ibrahim alayhi salam. You, you didn't even meet him. You guys weren't even alive when he was there. So why even talk about him? Let's talk about what, what you have in your books right now and what the situation is at present. Why do you avoid having a, having a talk on that? Right? Then verse 68 onwards, it says, Indeed, the most worthy of Ibrahim among the people are those who followed him and this prophet and those who believe in his message and Allah is the friend of the believers. So if you call yourself followers of the Abrahamic faith, well, then make sure you're following Ibrahim. Because this man, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is following Ibrahim He's doing. He's giving the exact same message. And Allah says, A faction of the people of the book wish they could mislead you, but they do not mislead except themselves, and they do not perceive it. O oh, people of the book, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah while you witness to their truth? You know in your heart, you know what's going on, and Allah knows what you're thinking. So just admit to it. What's taking you so long? And O oh, people of the book, why do you confuse the truth with falsehood and conceal the truth while you know what the truth is? And then Allah says in verse 72, and a, and a fraction of the people of the book say to each other, listen, believe in that which was revealed to the believers at the beginning of the day and reject it towards the end of the day. Perhaps they will abandon their, um, their faith. So, um, in other words, the Jews came up with this idea that, okay, uh, when Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes out and he starts talking about Islam and all, his, on, all the believers in Medina are sitting over there and they're, you know, they're um, paying attention, uh, why don't we go in and we will join them and we'll say, yes, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right, we believe, we believe. But then by the end of the day, we'll go out and say, no, 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 we don't believe. And he says it will cause confusion because the Arabs, the, uh, the, the Muslims, the Muslim Arabs, re remember, they always considered the Jews to be people of the book, right? People who are very learned, who have always received books from God, right? So if the Jews who are so learned, if they in the beginning say, yes, we believe, then they go back, then something happens. And then they come at night and they say, no, 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 we don't believe. Then what do you think must have happened? That a lot of people must have, you know, got confused. Because they must have thought, okay, maybe they believed, then they went back, then they checked their books, and then they realized that the message was totally different. So that's why they came back, and now they're saying, no, we don't believe. So the Jews said this will be a great way of confusing them so that they abandon their religion. They were coming up with all these new tactics and strategies. And here's an interesting thing. But Allah is saying is that, okay, if you, if you don't want to believe, don't believe, fine. Why are you making so much effort in trying to make sure that other Muslims also leave Islam? Does that make sense? I mean, the polytheists had their own um, had their own faith, right? So uh, the the Arabs who were polytheists were worshiping different idols. They had the, they had their own religion. The Jews denied it, right? So if you deny this man Muhammad peace be upon him, then fine, just deny him. Why do you say no? We'll deny him, but we have to make sure that other Muslims also leave him so that Islam doesn't spread. And so Allah says, and do not trust, uh, accept those who follow your religion. Say, indeed, the truth, the true guidance is the guidance of Allah. Sorry, this part, and do not trust, accept those who follow your deen. This is a continuation of what the Jews were saying. So they were saying, uh, believe in the morning, abandon it at night. And don't trust anyone except those who follow your deen. So just follow the Jews. Don't even use your mind and think. Say, indeed, the true guidance is the guidance of Allah. Do you fear that some, lest someone be given knowledge like you were given or that they would argue with you before Allah? Say, indeed, all bounties in the hands of Allah. He grants it to whom he wills and Allah is all encompassing and wise. He selects for his mercy whom he wills. Allah is the possessor of great bounty. So, the interesting thing that you see over here is, let me ask you a question. The Jews were saying, don't follow anyone, don't listen to anyone, don't talk to anyone, unless he's a Jew. Don't even listen to what they're saying, right? Because they will, um, they will basically misguide you. Don't we say the same thing? Yeah. Um, so why, no, no, no. why is Allah saying they're wrong? Why is Allah saying that the Jews are, are saying don't tr trust anyone except those who follow your religion? 
Well, that's normal. They should say that. I mean, don't we say that? Mm-hmm. So, but what's wrong with they that? They know deep down that their religion is right. And they're trying to misguide them. First of all, um, do you remember the verse where Allah said that the truth has come, so there is no coercion now. You cannot force anyone into Islam. The truth is clear, right? Yeah. Allah never says, don't talk to anyone or don't investigate or do research regarding the other other faiths. Allah, saying there are, Allah says there are other religions. Investigate all of them. You want to you study their books? Investigate all of them. Investigate all of them. And if you are searching for the truth, then your heart will automatically testify to the Quran. So Muslims, Allah does not say, no, 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 don't even open the other books. Don't even go near them. Don't even talk to a Christian or a Jew about his religion because that's not right. Allah is saying, investigate, do an open research. If your heart is really searching for the truth, you'll, you'll figure it out. But the Jews were saying, no, don't, don't even ask, don't even talk to them. So the minute the Prophet gets up and gives a sermon, walk away, run away. Don't listen to him, right? And this is what Allah is saying that, no, this is uh, something that is wrong. Listen, use the akal that Allah has given you and you'll be able to arrive at the correct conclusion. And so then Allah is asking them, are you, are you working so hard to extinguish Islam because you are terrified that someone else has been given the kind of knowledge that you have with you and you're terrified that now they might argue with you in front of Allah? In other words, the rabbis had spent all their time doing what to the books? Distorting them. Distorting them. And they had made up all of these different stories. And now they're afraid that, well, nobody knows that, you know, we have distorted the books. But now there's a man. We cannot control him because he's from Bani Ismail. Right? We cannot control the fact that Jibreel keeps coming to him and giving him all this important information. Mm. And he's leaking our secrets. He's telling everyone exactly uh, the, the, the truth about our ancestors and the things that we've done. And he and, you know, they will provide an argument against us in front of Allah. So this is what they were so upset about when it came to Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so then um, Allah says over here that and among the people of the book is he who if you entrust him, now you would tell me what this means. Among the people of the book is he, if you entrust him with a great amount of wealth, he will return it to you. And among them is he, if you entrust him with a single silver coin, he will not give it back to you unless you are constantly standing over him and demanding it. That is because they say there is no blame upon us concerning the unlearned. And they speak untruth about Allah while they know it. But yes, whoever fulfills his commitment and fears Allah, indeed Allah loves those who fear him. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 What's going on? Yeah, in this verse he's basically saying that there are some people from uh, who are uh, Christians and Jews. Uh, and Jews who are uh, extremely uh, righteous and if you trust them with anything, they will um, you know uh, uh, give you that back uh, in 100% uh same amount. It's, it's, uh, one hundred percent same amount, but there there are also some people who who if you even give them like a very small thing that is not that valuable, they will still not give it back to you. Why? Because because they think that it's not their fault that you entrusted them with your things. Because they say there's no blame upon us concerning the unlearned. Because they consider themselves to be the learned and. The Arabs to be unlearned because you know they're Bani Israel and they're Bani Smite. So um, they they call the uh, the Arabs or they call all non-Jews, not just Arabs. They call all non-Jews Gentiles. In other words, they're not the chosen nation. So I told you that the rabbis had distorted the book so much that they said when it comes to sood and interest, it's, it's haram. haram. It's haram to charge sood from a Jew. But it's halal to charge sood from a non-Jew because Allah will not ask you. When it comes to a non-Jew, you can do whatever you want. God will just, he won't ask you. And so that's why Allah is saying this is the kind of distortions they have made. Indeed, those who exchange the covenant of Allah and their promises for a small price, they will have no share in the hereafter. Allah will not speak to them or even look at them on the day of resurrection. 
nor will he purify them and they will have a painful punishment. But this is also being repeated, please. Yes, this is being repeated actually many times as a warning that Allah won't purify you. He won't even look at you. He won't even talk to you. Now, something that's interesting here, I want to tell you a bit about the, the rabbis who distorted these books. Um, when it comes to the Solomon's Temple, initially what you had in the Solomon's Temple were people called priests, not rabbis. The term rabbi did not even exist. They were just priests, okay? And the priests believed that only we have the right to understand the books and to interpret the books because only we know the Hebrew language and only we have the knowledge. So if a common Jew, if he had a question, he had to go to the priest, he could not open up the books and study it himself. So the priests, of course, had power and they could make all kinds of changes. But then when the first time you have the Babylonian king, name was Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the entire Solomon's temple, Jews came back, they were able to rebuild it. Then what happened was Isa Salam came eventually. When Isa Salam came and then we know that he was raised, before um, Isa Salam uh, was raised, he gave a prophecy to the people, the, uh, to Bani Israel. And he said, a time is going to come when these signs will appear. Okay, he mentioned certain signs. He says, when those signs appear, there is an azab coming. So pack up your stuff and run. Okay, now subsequently he was raised, right? Now the Jews didn't even believe in him, but the disciples did. And the disciples started to spread his message after he was raised. And there were many people who started to believe. So they became, um, you know, they were the Muslims of that time. Okay, we, we will call them people who are? Christians, but at that time, they were the Muslims of that time. So uh, as soon as those signs started to appear, the Christians, they understood that this is what Isa had prophesied, and we believe in Isa. So they ran. The Jews ignored it. And it was basically a prophecy of the arrival of Titus. So if you look at the history books, uh, what is explained is that um, you know, the emperor, he started to force many of the Jews, many, many of the Ben Israel, that you guys have to worship our idols, you have to pay, pay tribute to our idols. And the Jews refused to. And so then it's believed that there was a, uh, some of the Jews started to become, you know, they became uh, very um, blunt and they would publicly and openly, they would go against the emperor's commands and wishes. So, uh, and at one point it's believed that they sent a small commander, a commander with a small army that, you know, you need to go and set these Bani Israelis, set these Jews straight because they're going against the emperor. And the Jews actually fought against the army and, um, you know, uh, they, were, they were able to do quite a bit of damage. So then the emperor sent Titus, who was a, a very strong commander and general, but he was the worst of all in terms of being a tyrant. He was the most cruel. So to set the Jews straight so that they never raise their heads against the emperor's commands again, he sent Titus with an army. And Titus, it's believed, he, he killed almost 1,100,000 Jews. And he burnt the Solomon's temple for the second time. He burnt people alive. He uh, killed uh, babies. It was the worst kind of torture that you could do. That is what Titus did. And that's why historians say that's so interesting. How come all the people who died that day were Jews? Where were the Christians? Because the Christians believed in Isa alayhi salam. They heard the prophecy. They believed in it and they ran. And then they left the, their, their land. Some went to Europe. Some went, you know, here or there. They migrated. But then a lot of the Jews were massacred. And a few of them who were able to escape, they also left the land and they migrated. After that, the Jews were never able to re-enter their promised land except when subsequently after World War II, what you end up having is a state of Israel was built. Many of the Zionists, I told you about this in the beginning, Zionists, a special class of the Jews who believe that this is our land, you know, and we have, and we have a right to go back. So they re-entered, re they started having a war with the Palestinians, and then a state of Israel was introduced. And this was in 1948, just uh, a year after the establishment of Pakistan. 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 So, um, by the way, I've, I've gone off track. What I was trying to say is that uh, at that time, you basically had the priests, okay? Now, after Titus came, and Solomon's temple is now permanently destroyed, and all the priests are dead, the term priests finished. Then, between the 2nd and the 6th century, you had a new group of people amongst the Jews who had been saved, 
a new group emerged called rabbis. And they were basically the scholars. So they said, we are scholars, we have studied the books, we have examined it, and they called themselves rabbis. And then they did a lot of work in really changing the books and saying, soothe is perfectly allowed and this and that and so on. Okay. So then Allah says in verse 80, uh, sorry, in verse 78, um, and indeed there is among them a party who alter the books with their tongues. So you may think it's from Allah, but it's actually not from Allah. It is not from the book. And they say, no, this is from Allah, but it's not. And they speak untruth about Allah while they know that it's, the, that it's not the truth. It is not for a human that Allah should give him the scripture and authority and prophethood. And then he would say to the people, be servants of me rather than Allah. Instead, he would say, be pious uh, um, scholars or followers of the Lord because of what you have taught of the scripture and because of what you have studied. Nor could he order you to take angels and prophets to be gods. Would he order you to disbelieve after you have been Muslims? Now, this again is talking to the Jews and Christians, another argument. Now, um, what some of the rabbis would do is they would, it says over here that they would say things with their tongues and they would say, this is in the book. But Allah, Allah said, it's not in the book. They're saying things that it's from Allah, but it's not. Now, this could mean two things. First of all, it clearly means that they were distorting. They distorted the books and they said, look, it's here. It's in the book. It's from God. And Allah saying, no, it was never in the book. They have lied. Another thing some of them would do is they would say, well, the Arabs don't know Hebrew. And the common Jew doesn't know exactly what's in the book. So they would start reading, they would start um, um, saying it out loud, but as they would recite, they would twist the words. And they would tell the Arab, see, it's here, it's in my book. Now the Arab cannot confirm because it's in Hebrew, he doesn't know, right? And the normal Jew who's listening, even he, he, he won't confirm because he'll say, okay, this is my scholar, he's telling me it's in the book, it has to be in the book. Mm -hmm. So Allah is saying this is one of the things they would do, they would twist their words. And Allah then says, uh, it is not possible for a prophet like Isa salam, to ever be given the book to become a prophet and then for him to tell people, listen, worship me. Don't worship God, worship me. Uh, instead, Allah is saying, he would obviously, obviously say, be worshippers of the Lord because he gave you the book. He's taught you everything in the book. And never would he ever say, Take angels and prophets to be your gods. No prophet would ever say anything like this. Allah is now actually, he is clarifying on behalf of Isa salam, that I know my prophet. Prophets cannot possibly use this language. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, he mentions angels. Because, uh, because in the Holy Trinity, that they believe in, yes. uh, they believe in the Holy Ghost. Who Which is, is Jibreel. Jibreel? Very good, excellent. They no, believe... but they, no, but didn't they come uh, later on? What came later on? No, uh, I told they you. Started believing in the the Holy later. Ghost concept came in the fifth century, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, we're talking about seventh century. Oh, okay. So, uh, one is that brilliant example of Jibreel, alayhi salam, and also they came up with st uh, st stories that, for example, in the Old Testament, it mentions uh, the angel Z Zadkil. His name is Zadkil, and it's believed that he is responsible for granting God's love and God's mercy. So if you really want God to love you, if you really want God to forgive you, then you need to invoke the angel Zadkil. Mm -hmm. These are just a few examples of how they made so many distortions that when it was, the, the uh, deen was simple. You want something, you want to talk to someone, you have a direct communication with God. They put in an angel Zadkil, an angel Jibreel, who is now the Holy Ghost, priest, bishop, pope, rabbi, so many people, when you just don't need any of them. Mm. And so then Allah says in 81 and 82, and recall, O people of the book, when Allah took the covenant of the prophets. Now, you know this, I, th I hope you remember this. Um, Allah took a covenant of all the prophets. Uh, saying, what, whatever I give you of the scripture and the wisdom, and then if there comes to you a messenger confirming what is with you, you must believe in him and support him. Mm -hmm. And Allah said, have you acknowledged and taken upon, uh, upon that my commitment? And they all said, we have acknowledged it. 
And he said, then bear witness, I am with you among the witnesses, and whoever turns away, they are the definely disobedient. Mm -hmm. Where did this covenant take place? Where all the prophets mm -hmm. were told basically what? That uh, during your lifetime, if another Nabi ya Rasul comes to you, who is basically uh, confirming the message that you have uh, um, been given, been given, right? And then you have to start believing in him, supporting him, supp uh, supporting him, and start believing in his uh, uh, Sharia and his book, and the few changes that he has brought. Very good, brilliant. Now, any idea when this covenant was taken? Uh, before, uh, uh, was Adam, uh, before you know. Yeah, I know. So you know but like, the question is, do you know? <laughs> oh, well, at the same time as the covenant was taken from us. Right. So when we all were up in the heavens yeah. and Allah took a covenant from all of us and said, I am your Lord. And we said, yes, Allah, you are our Lord. After that, Allah took another covenant just from all of the Nabis. Now, the question it says over here, he talks about a misak which was used about the Nabi. So all the Nabis, now are are the Rasul's Nabis too? No. What? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So yes. when he took a he took a covenant from all the Nabis, which includes the, the Nabis and the Rasuls. Yeah. And and listen to the language. He told all of them that while if I've sent you and I've given you a message, and while you are there, there comes to you Ja Akum Rasul. While you're there, a Rasul comes to you. Yeah, basically, so while you're there, if a new, if a new Rasul comes to you, who brings, who brings his own book and his own Asharia, you have, you have to, to start uh, following so him. So what if there's a Nabi and there's another Nabi that comes? Two Nabis. Yeah. Uh, then that one Nabi has to start following the other Nabi. Yeah, but in this case now, they both are Nabis. Yeah, so they both just... There's no... There's no preach. Yeah, so they both simply preach Islam. That's it. But Allah's making it clear that... If there's a Nabi and now a Rasul has come, now for instance, if a Nabi first came, the Nabi is saying, follow the previous Rasul, right? Mm -hmm. But now while you're alive, a new one has come. So now you have to tell everyone, okay, now you all follow this new Rasul. So when Yahya salam came and Isa was not yet born, Yahya was a Nabi. He was telling them all to follow which Rasul? The previous one. Who was? Zakaria. <laughs> no, he was not a Rasul. Musa alayhi salam, Mus who had come centuries ago, the laws of Moses. He was the Mus last Rasul? He was the previous one. Uh, who, the, uh, he had the come, last one before. Uh, he, he came centuries ago, but that's why they all were following the laws of Musa. Suleiman alayhi salam was following the laws of Musa. Daud alayhi salam, the laws of Musa. They, because Musa alayhi salam had come to them and he gave them a laws of Torah. So Torah is what all the Jews were following. So Yahya salam said, follow the Torah, follow the laws of Musa. And while he's alive, now Yahya has come. And Yahya, sorry, while Yahya is alive, Isa salam has come. And Isa salam has brought his own book and Sharia and he is a Rasul. So mm -hmm. then Yahya salam said, okay, now follow this man. Follow his laws because he made slight changes as Allah had told him to do so. So he said, now this is the man you follow. He is the... the um, the most updated Rasul. Get it? Yeah, but why did Hazrat Yahya uh, kill before? He was later Isha on. Islam. No, no, no. Not no, I, I told you. Before Isa Islam became mature. No. No, he was He was not. That's why he was going around saying, Isa is mm -hmm. here. He's a Rasul. He's giving the message. Follow him. But then subsequently he was beheaded. And this is important because the Nabis are being told, don't create confusion. Don't don't uh, um, you know have ego and pride. That no, I was talking about Musa. So why should now? Why should I suddenly now start to follow this new uh, man? Mm -hmm. Right? The Nabis were being trained that when a Rasul comes, you this is how you have to behave. And if you behave like this, then you have to tell everyone you guys do the same thing. Right? When a new uh, uh, prophet comes or a new Rasul comes. Mm -hmm. He is now cancelling the previous stuff and he's bringing new things. So now follow this man. What was Hazrat Yahya, uh, like, uh, uh, how was he related to his Isa? Yes, no. I think you've forgotten. Remember Zakri alayhi salam? What was Zakri alayhi salam to Isa? He was his tutor. Uh, not tutor. <laughs> tutor. 
مریم علیہ السلام مریم علیہ السلام انکل مریم علیہ السلام انکل و ذکری علیہ السلام وچ مین ذکری سن یاہیا واز مریم علیہ السلام کزن رائٹ اوکے نا بیکاز دے بوتھ ور کزنس اف دے بوتھ ار کزنس دین مریم علیہ السلام سن عیسا بیسکلی عیساز انکل بیکمز یاہیا رائٹ بیکاز یاہیا علیہ السلام اینڈ مریم علیہ السلام ور کزنس وچ مس مین دیٹ مریم سن کین ناٹ بی ا کزن ٹو ٹو یاہیا بیکاز یاہیا از مچ اولڈر So Yahya alayhi salam was like an uncle to Isa. But again, that's family politics. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that Yahya alayhi salam was a Nabi and while he was alive, a Rasul was sent. And in this, in fact, I want to share this beautiful hadith with you. Muhammad, peace be upon him, <clears throat> in a hadith, he said to his people, by the one, I swear, by the one who owns Muhammad's soul, in other words, I swear by God, if Musa, alayhi salam appeared to you all you muslims if he appeared to you and you followed him and left me you would go astray from the right path and if he were alive and reached the time of my prophethood then he would have followed me in other words that now i am the latest rasul so if musa less if all if any of you still believe in musa or you follow musa but you're not following me then you're doing the wrong thing. You've not entered into Islam. And if Musa were alive, and if he reached the time of my prophethood, then even Musa would be following me. Because he was a previous Rasul, and now while he's alive, a new Rasul has come. Right? So whether it's a Nabi or whether it is a Rasul, if you're alive and a new Rasul comes, you've got to start following him. Mm-hmm. Um, now verse 83 to 85 it says so is it other than the religion of Allah that they desire while to him have submitted all those within the heavens and the earth willingly or by compulsion and to him they will be returned so Allah is saying everything in the heavens and the earth is willingly or by compulsion already worshipping him So then Allah says, say, we have believed in Allah and say that we have believed in Allah and in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Ibrahim, Ismail, Isaac, Yaqub and the descendants and in what was given to Musa and Isa and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. We are Muslims to him. And whoever desires other than Islam as a religion, never will it be accepted from him and he in the hereafter will be amongst the losers. So you cannot say, Yala, I followed Musa and I was doing everything that Musa salam, had taught me because if while you're alive a new Rasul has come, whether that is Isa or whether that is now Muhammad, peace be upon him, that's the one you have to follow. Okay? But interestingly, how do we know that everything has submitted their will already um, to Allah? Have a uh, over, over every uh, creation of Allah was offered to have a rule. I know, no, no, that, that's different. That's different. We're saying over here, Allah is saying, is it other than the religion of Allah that you want? While already to him has submitted everything in the heavens and the earth, willingly or unwillingly. Uh-huh. What has submitted to Allah? Allah is basically saying willingly or unwillingly, everything is already worshipping me. Uh-huh. So if you don't want to, that's okay. But look around you, everything is already worshipping me. Uh-huh. 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 What does that mean? What do you mean? How is everything already uh, worshipping Allah? There are so many non-Muslims that they're, they're not worshipping Allah. So what yes, does Allah mean? The Jews and the Christians, they worship Allah. But there are so many polytheists who don't worship. Allah is saying everything, look around you. Everything around you is already willingly or unwillingly. So whether they want to or whether, uh, or, or whether they're doing it unwillingly by force. Everything's worshipping me. <laughs> okay, I'll explain to you what this means. Allah is saying that everything in the world, willingly or unwillingly, is already worshipping me. And what that means is uh, everything in the heavens and the earth, sun, moon, stars, or, um, uh, even the soil. Allah explains everything that you see out here is something that Allah has created and it is alive. You cannot see that it's alive, but it's alive. And while it's being alive, it is by design, it is worshipping Allah. And then of course, besides that, Allah is saying there are many Muslims who are willingly, they are choosing to worship Allah. 
But at the same time, Allah says there are many things that are unwillingly even uh, worshipping Allah. And in that case, he's telling the non-Muslims that if you guys don't want to worship me, even though everything around you has already submitted itself to me, everything in the heavens and the earth and in the universe, as well as the Muslims, but if you still don't want to worship me, then the funny thing is that your body has already submitted itself to me, even though you don't want to. So your heart is beating because it is following my command. It has submitted itself to me. Your eyes and ears are working because it submitted itself to my command. If I tell your eyes and ears to stop working, they will stop working. If I tell your heart to stop beating, it will stop beating. So your liver, kidneys, every single thing in your body is actually in my control and it is already following my command. In fact, each of these things are alive and they are following my command. We know that because from the Hadith we understand that on the Day of Judgment, even our, our eyes will speak, our hands will speak, our feet will testify. So each and everything, um, even that is there in our body, is alive and it is worshipping God. It is following God's command. So Allah is saying, if you don't want to worship me, then that's fine. Then that's your choice. It's, it's your loss. But what you don't realize is that although you are unwilling, your body has already submitted itself to me. You cannot stop your body from worshipping me. You cannot stop your eyes and ears or your heart from following my command. So you already are unwillingly, uh, you have submitted yourself to me. Unwillingly, you are worshipping me. You don't want to, but your body is already doing it. So inshallah, we'll stop here and continue on in the next lecture. We'll continue on with verses 86 onwards. Assalamu alaikum.